Uh, and now for today's event. Uh, a few years ago, when I'd uh, talk about inflation to my undergraduate students, these 20 year olds, they'd look at me with blank stares. Why are we having to learn all this history? Uh, now, when we get to inflation, uh, everybody perks up because they know it's it's front and center. Uh, and everybody is interested in uh, how did the Fed get us here and how are they going to get us out? Uh, and we're really pleased to have the perfect guy to talk about that. Uh, Jeff Lacker uh, started off teaching at Purdue University and joined the staff of the Federal Reserve Bank in Richmond as a research economist in 1989, which I think is where I first yeah. met him, though we were talking about maybe we, we ran into each other before that. Uh, he quickly rose up through the ranks, and in 2004, he became the president uh, of the bank and uh, served as president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond uh, until 2017. Uh, as bank president, he was a rotating member of the Federal Open Market Committee, which uh, sets interest rates and makes the major monetary policy decisions for the United States. So he's he's an ideal person to talk about these issues. He's He was an insider, so he really knows what he's talking about. Uh, and having retired in 2017, he's now an outsider, so he's free to tell us uh, exactly uh, uh, call it like he sees it. Although one of the things I always admired about, always admired about Jeff was even when he was on the uh, committee he, and he when he disagreed, which he did on many occasions, uh, he he did speak his mind. It was very welcome, uh, and uh, uh, so we're we're really uh, fortunate to have him today. Uh, please join me in welcoming Jeff Lacker. Uh, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I actually first um, had contact with Jim in his job market paper in 1981. I was a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin, and he did a great job there. And uh, I'm sure he's doing a great job uh, here uh, at the university. Um, a word first before I begin um, about the suit and tie. Someone remarked upon it when I first came in. I was surprised that, uh, you know, know. are you still wearing suits and ties on the East Coast? Uh, well, the answer is, you know, I just haven't fully depreciated the suits and ties I wore up to Washington all the time, trying to get more use out of them, save some of my other clothing budget uh, for the longer haul. Uh, so uh, this talks about inflation. Uh, there was a surge began in the end of 2020, beginning of 2021. Um, it was quite notable. One of the most notable things about the pandemic. Um, a lot has been written about the pandemic, but uh, I'll just be focusing on inflation. Um, and the Fed's response and um, what the Fed should learn about uh, itself, about its conduct of policy, and about how it did uh, during the um, uh, surge. So there's a widespread agreement uh, that um, the Fed should have responded earlier uh, with uh, more force. Um, uh, that doing so would have uh, offered the, po the strong possibility uh, of Oh, uh, reducing the extent of the inflation surge, reducing the dislocations involved in uh, the surge of inflation, and uh, reduce the adjust the cost of adjusting to the measures it's had to take. Now, I think there's very widespread agreement. It's not universal. Widespread agreement um, uh -oh. on that as a matter of hindsight, uh -oh. ex post, um, that there's regret. Uh, and the Fed, many Fed members of the Fed, FOMC and the what Fed here? officials yeah. have, have expressed that. I think there's a very strong case, and I think there's broad agreement as well, maybe not quite as broad, but broad agreement as well, that at the time, given what they knew then, um, it was a mistake, that ex ante, um, it was um, a bit of a blunder. Uh, so I'm going to be making uh, that uh, case to you uh, today. And- you know, the, the most important con and constructive approach you can take is to ask, well, what should we take away from that? What, we should, what should we do differently in the future? Now, I, I'm going to point out about this surge that we're not out of the woods yet. And uh, you know, that's been on the display in the newspapers this morning in the coverage of just have one? the yeah. press that conference I should yesterday have to stay at on the it? end of the Federal Open Market Committee's <laughs> meeting uh, by Jay Powell, in which he was quizzed about uh, the course of monetary policy. Inflation's running between three and 4% now over the last few months. Um, at the end of last year, some very favorable numbers led the Fed to um, project that they were likely to cut rates several times. Um, this year, markets doubled that. <laughs> it's 
for projected, uh, you know, six rate cuts this year. That was clearly um, getting out over their skis. Um, but the feds had to rein that those expectations in. And now it looks plausible that they're not even going to uh, cut rates at all this year. And the conversation is going to be whether uh, inflation com data come in so firm over the next few months that they're, they're going to have to contemplate raising rates at some point. Uh, but I think for now they're on hold. So we're not out of the woods yet, but it's still enough of the surge is behind us. Uh, the peak is behind us. Uh, it makes it timely. The other reason it makes this timely uh, to, to ponder is that um, the Fed, as I'll describe, has a has a strategic framework, a, like a one-page document summarizing how it thinks about the conduct of monetary policy. And uh, we first uh, issued this in 2012. A revised version was, was uh, issued in 2020. And at the time, they pledged, the Fed pledged to revisit this every five years. So a revisitation is coming up and uh, the review of the framework document is underway, going to be underway this year into next year. So now's a good time for, the, I think, the public to discuss what lessons the Fed ought to emerge, to ought to um, learn. And uh, that can be good uh, input into their deliberations. And hopefully they'll take a lot of this on board um, and learn some good lessons. So uh, these views are my own and not necessarily those of anyone in the Fed. That's of course given since I haven't been in the Fed since 2017, uh, but I'm a member of the something called the Shadow Open Market Committee. Um, the Shadow Open Market Committee. This isn't working. I know you kept doing it inadvertently. There we go. Um, okay, uh, so uh, this show this shows inflation since 1960. Uh, the the Shadow Open Market Committee was formed in 1973 when inflation was starting to get out of control. Uh, meets twice a year, issues position papers um, critiquing Fed uh, policy. So it's a group of now 10 or 12 um, economists, many f former Fed officials. Um, and um, it, it's been an honor for me to, to join that uh, in the last couple of years. Um, and so it's, but it's, it, it's a group that maybe had less to talk about in this intervening period uh, where the green bar is. So this, I, I put this first just to show the magnitude of the underperformance here. The surge at the end here is what we're going to be talking about and what the Fed could have done to prevent it. It came at the end of a 20-something year period starting in 1995 where the Fed was targeting 2% inflation. Now, at a meeting in, in uh, July of 1995, they decided that 2% inflation is what they were after. But Greenspan warned the committee, don't let that number get out of this room. Uh, Greenspan wanted to preserve the political maneuverability and, and um, uh, deflect attention. In 2012, we finally announced that we're targeting 2% inflation. Now, in the meantime, the number bled out. I mean, I think financial market participants, knowledgeable observers of the Fed figured out by the early 2000s, yeah, they're, they want inflation to be around 2%. A lot of other central banks had said 2%. It made sense for a lot of reasons. Um, so that's how that, that played out. But you, you can see here by comparison, the disaster of the 1970s, those huge peaks. Um, some of you look as if you might've been around then in financial markets. Um, I was a uh, youngster then, but still uh, active and getting into the economics profession. So it, it wasn't as bad as the 70s, but a key thing to note here is that there was a surge followed by a retreat of inflation, followed by another surge. So this is something that has to be on the minds of, of um, uh, Fed officials at this point. So this zooms in on uh, the period since uh, 2018, um, shows you in more detail. The gray line is added here. That's the federal funds rate. Uh, and you can see that they cut rates dramatically in, in 2020 uh, at the outset of the pandemic, realizing that economic activity was contracting and that some stimulus to help the economy recover was warranted. So they cut rates to zero then. But then you can see um, inflation rise in the 2021 time period, the first half of 2021. It rose pretty 
steadily and dramatically and continually. And the Fed waited until March of 2022 uh, to raise interest rates and start tightening policy. Now, they tightened policy with alacrity, um, picked up pace in 23, um, as uh, in 22, as you uh, as you know, and then taper, uh, sort of tapered off and then rates have been flat for almost a year. That's where we are now. So inflation has come down since then, but again, it's not down to 2%. This is the year over year uh, PCE inflation. PCE stands for personal consumption expenditures. This is the Fed's favorite. It's one that adjusts for shifting composition of uh, consumer basket, uh, bread, consumer spending uh, basket. But um, it also includes a bunch of imputed items uh, like healthcare paid for by your insurance company things that people don't lay out cash for. The CPI, the Consumer Price Index, more popularly known, uh, gets more attention, released a little earlier each month, is slightly higher on, generally on an ongoing basis for various reasons, and it's just focused on outlays. Um, so this shows how far the Fed strayed from its past patterns of reacting to increases of inflation. Um, it shows uh, the real federal funds rate. So the black line is the federal funds rate minus a measure of expected inflation. And here, the simplest proxy that goes all the way back to 1960 is to subtract off the last 12-month inflation rate, um, being the, the idea being that that's generally how people general, people's forecast of inflation over the next 12 months is generally pretty close to what it was the last 12 months. Um, there's other more sophisticated measures based on surveys and the like. They generally give the same answer. What you can see is that the when inflation rose and the Fed kept interest rates at zero, the real federal funds rate fell dramatically far lower than it's ever been since the 70s. So a fairly dramatic easing of monetary policy implicitly as inflation rose. And this zooms in on the most recent period and shows you that over the course of the period between the, the summer of 2021, July 2021, and uh, later in March, there was a further easing of policy, even though it was pretty clear at the time in, uh, I'd argue, uh, August of 21, that, that policy needed to be tightened. So another portrayal of the extent to which the Fed delayed uh, tightening. So why did inflation surge? Um, so in a nutshell, uh, a lot could be said about this. I'll, I'll just touch on the high points. Um, there were, in the pandemic, business closures that reduced uh, revenues at businesses and it the sending workers home reduced labor income. Um, so consumer spending fell. Consumer spending fell also because people didn't want to go to the places they would otherwise go to spend that money. Um, firms reduced employment because of the fall in consumer spending. Um, and so there was sort of a combined effect on both demand and supply in a lot of sectors, not everywhere, not uniformly, but in a lot of sectors. There was a huge shift in consumer spending towards goods. People started ordering from Amazon. Delivery at home made a lot of sense. There were large fiscal me measures designed to offset the effects on income and business revenue. So there were checks sent out. There were PPP loans made that, you know, people had a good reason to believe would be forgiven ultimately. Um, and these came in a couple of waves. I'll show you them later. Not all of these were spent. A lot of them were just stockpiled. People just sort of let them pile up in their bank accounts um, or their savings accounts. In uh, late 2020, um, constraints were relaxed, but then there was another wave of uh, the virus and then things tightened up in that winter and then they were relaxed again in early 2021. And that was the big sort of rush of people going out to eat again and, and the like. There was another round of fiscal measures in December and then March of 2020 and then March of 2021. And then spending surged in 2021. It surged faster than supply came back. And that's the recipe for inflation. So this... Um, this shows you what happened um, with these these uh, relief measures. Uh, the the graph on the left is personal transfer receipts. These are 
like 99.9% of this is government transfers to people. And they spike, you can see in April of 20, uh, December of 20, and March of 2021. On the right, uh, the um, blue line that has the spiky part is the personal savings rate. So it's the it's what people save divided by their income. And you can see that that spikes with each of these transfer receipts. So it's it's income minus spending. So income goes up, but they're not, their spending doesn't go up by as much as the transfer payments. So the result is that the 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 excess gets accumulated. So the the orange line is a calculation of what was their uh, of what savings would have been, and uh, what savings was, and savings what savings actually was minus what it would have been if it followed the trend without these transfer payments. Um, that piled up to the, the tune of two trillion dollars um, by uh, 2021, and but then you can see the savings rate here. This is this part right here. You can see the savings rate falling below trend. So in here, people are spending down their sa accumulated savings and this excess savings falls again. Um, so the question is, why did the Fed delay? This is my list of candidate explanations that I'm going to focus on. These are explanations that I think where I think the Fed has some learning it could do. And I'm going to go through these in sequence. I'll just review them quickly now. The Fed adopted, as I said, this revised policy framework in 2020. And at the September 2020 meeting, they put new language, new forward guidance sort of uh, language in their statement that hints about future uh, policy conduct in the September 2020 meeting to implement consistent with this new policy framework. Um, they had uh, also forward guidance language about their asset purchases. So they, in the... Um, spring of 2020 had begun purchasing U.S. Treasury securities and um, uh, mortgage-backed securities backed by uh, federal agencies. Um, and they had provided, they provided language about the process by which they would end that if they ever did. And uh, that forward guidance language sort of tied their hands at one point. Early in 2021, they made, their assessment was that the initial surge of inflation was transitory. And that proved to be wrong. And I'll argue two other things that are more in the nature of kind of governance, more political. Um, one is that um, the political engagement of the Fed in the congressional deliberations and the administration's deliberations regarding the relief measures in, in 2020 and 2021 may have inhibited their willingness to pivot to restraint from stimulus to restraint in 2021. And then I'll argue that um, you can see evidence of a declining diversity of views um, at the Federal Reserve over the course of time between Bernanke, say 2009, and now. And um, that I think one result of that may have been, don't know, is just having to infer from outside evidence, but it may have been that the robustness of the, the decision makers engagement with different points of view was not what it could have been. So those are my five candidates. So to start, uh, the August 20 uh, revision of the 2012 po policy framework tilted policy away from price stability towards the so-called employment mandate, Fed price stability, employment, two sides of the mandate. Um, it, it, uh, put in descriptive language about the employment objective, broad-based and inclusive. And it it said, well, we're not going to try and uh, push against employment being above what we think of as maximum. We're only going to push against employment falling short of maximum. And it adopted this flexible average inflation targeting framework where it said that we want inflation to average 2% over time. So if we underrun, we're going to make up for it by overrun, moderately overshooting. Now, in contrast, what it had been doing was saying, we want inflation to be 2% from now on. And bygones were bygones. Um, those are two different ways to run monetary policy. And uh, they have pluses and minuses. Um, but key thing here is that it was asymmetric. It bled out over a couple of months after they adopted this, that they don't intend to compensate for or make up for overshoots that this was just an, 
undershoot um, measure. Arguably taken as a whole, the tilt towards employment away from price stability, widely covered at the time, arguably um, diminished the perceived propensity of the Fed to resist inflation above 2%. The way they implemented tied their hands. Um, this was from the um, state. This is new language from the statement they issued in 2020. Um, the key thing is that the committee will aim to achieve mo inflation moderately above 2% for some time. Um, and uh, down below in that first paragraph, um, it, it, the committee expects to maintain an accommodative stance, that's code word for zero interest rates, until these outcomes are achieved, until Inflation's moderately above 2% and um, uh, and so on. Then below, this is the key thing. I'm going to read the whole thing. Committee decided to keep the target range for the federal funds rate at zero to quarter percent and expects it will be appropriate. So an aside here, the Fed is describing what it thinks the future FOMC will want to do. It's not promising to do anything in particular. It's just saying what their forecast of their future selves is, is. So anyway, expects it will be appropriate to maintain this target range until labor market conditions have reached levels consistent with the committee's success assessment of maximum employment and inflation has risen to 2% and is on track to moderately exceed 2% for some time. So they have to get, if inflation rises, they're still going to keep interest rates at zero unless they're at maximum employment. So they tied their hands by saying, well, you know, unless we're at maximum employment, we're not gonna fight inflation. They had an escape clause. This paragraph or something like it has been in the statement for a couple decades now. Um, the key sentence is the one in bold in the middle. The committee would be prepared to adjust the stance of policy as appropriate if risks emerge that could impede the attainment of the committee's goals. So this comes at the end. And it's been in there for the express purpose of giving the Fed something to point to for deviate if they want it in case they wanted to deviate from forward guidance provided up above in the statement. Long standing thing. But they, the Fed never invoked this. They appeared to treat this as boilerplate um, and to keep and to view the maximum employment commitment as, as binding. So they, they had the flexibility to, to, to adjust, but they didn't take advantage of it. So the lesson learned, I think, is that um, the, the framework should make some explicit discussion about immoderate overshoots of inflation. The, the Fed envisioned, the state, the 2020 framework envisioned moderate overshoots only, not immoderate overshoots. They should have a comprehensive treatment of various inflation strategies, various inflation scenarios and how they would react in each of these. So maximum employment is the weak link here. So you might wonder what maximum employment is. Well, the words come from the 1977 law that spells out the Fed's objectives. Congress's directive to the Fed, here's how to do your monetary policy work. And it says three things. It says maximum employment, stable prices, and low long-term interest rates. Well, everyone agrees that low inflation is the way to get low long-term interest rates. So even though there's three mandates, everyone sort of ignores the third one and thinks about it, this in terms of employment and price stability. And so the maximum employment is the, the word that Congress used. The Fed interprets that in a particular way I'll talk about more later. But um, th these the estimates, are it's an econometric exercise, and you're always going to get some, some uncertainty there. You're always going to have some some problems pitting that down, and particularly at times where the economy and the structure of the economy is shifting rapidly. It's really hard to pin down exactly what maximum employment is. So I, I think the Fed would be well advised to avoid linking forward guidance tightly to maximum employment, and they ought to take their escape clauses seriously and put more emphasis on them in public communications, prepare the markets for it, point to it and say, well, yeah, we think we're going to do this, but you know, there's if something happens, it's unanticipated, we could deviate from that. Um, preemption is something that's important. And I think they need to reinstall that, so reinstate that. So the September 2020 language essentially took preemption off the table. It said, we're not going to raise rates off zero. 
until both maximum employment and we get inflation actually over 2%. So it, it sort of takes off the table what the Fed did often in the 80s and 90s um, called you know preemption, sort of preemptively raising rates when it looks like inflation pressures are going to emerge to push inflation up, not waiting for those inflation pressures to push measured 12-month inflation above uh, the target so much. Um, and that was really important in the process of getting to where the Fed was in the mid-1990s with inflation running about 2% and them uh, deciding, it, yeah, they could handle sort of targeting there. So I think they need to reinstate uh, preemptive um, policy increases. Second problem, uh, the liftoff of rates was was tied to the end of asset purchases. Back in the 2010s, first time they did asset purchase, first couple of times, at first we thought, well, we could we can sell off, we can raise rates before we start selling off assets. But in the mid 2010s, they decided, no, we're not going to raise rates until we're done buying assets. Until any idea is buying assets is stimulative, raising rates is contractionary. Well, the effect of buying assets is, is probably small, could be zero, hard to estimate. Um, it's a marginal thing. And rates are the big thing, right? I mean, raising rates is something you can do with alacrity and at scale and at big size. Um, the Fed uh, set conditions in December 2020 on its asset purchases and said that um, it's not going to end them until it's made further progress towards its, uh, its goals. It promised to taper them before it ended them. So, you know, it was buying at a certain pace per month. It would sort of scale that down, walk that down month by month. I, I do not know why they feel like they need to taper that. That I'm the explanations for it, the analysis. We did this in the mid 2010s and agreed the flow doesn't matter. What matters is the stock of assets you buy. And nonetheless, they promised to taper them for a period and they promised advance notice before announcing a decision to taper. The advance notice was given in September, 2021. So arguably that was a timely move to tighten policy, but they had set up a sequence where they promised not to raise rates until they were done tapering. They promised to announce tapering. They promised to give advance notice of announcing tapering. So in September, they give an advance notice. November, they announced tapering. Tapering commences, not complete until March, 2022. So observing this sequence, which again, they had an escape clause for, didn't invoke. Observing this sequence delayed them from September when arguably they should have started raising rates till March. Lesson learned, communication should emphasize contingency. Things are uncertain. The Fed needs to respond. They should make a concerted effort to do so. Um, the communications from the Fed uh, tend to focus on the most likely outcome. And it's it's a weird outcome. I mean, it's it's a weird set of projections. Twice, uh, four times a year, they release projections, a summary of economic projections. I was asked to fill those out and I submitted mine. And so it's a compilation of 19 committee participants' um, projections. The instructions are under what you view as appropriate policy, in the absence of any further economic disturbances. So by construction, this is a best case scenario. This is a best case forecast. And you look at them and yeah, they look a little rosy from time to time. And I think that that bites them. The other thing is that there's this preoccupation with the median or mean of the projection, uh, the median dot plot. So last month when they, or last meeting, meeting before this one this year, this week where they, release these, um, they release the latest projections in March, there's this debate, is the median going to go from three cuts to two cuts? And the median is right on three cuts. Like if one more person had gone two cuts, it would have been the three to two cuts. The headlines would have been two cuts instead of three. Um, totally, uh, total overemphasis, I believe, on the median projection. And uh, it, it's hard to it's just hard to push back against that. And I, but I think the Fed needs to make a, a greater effort to do so. Um, they, I think they should consider overhauling the summary of economic projections. I think the way the dot plots are framed and um, is is uh, misleading 
it conveys a greater sense of confidence about the economic projections. I think they should discuss alternative scenarios. Some of my colleagues on the Shadow Open Market Committee have, have pushed this idea, um, the idea that they should discuss different things that could happen. So inflation could revert this year. It could fall back down again to about a 2% range that we're seeing for a few months in the end of last year and gave them confidence that they'd be able to cut rates this year. They should discuss what happens if inflation stays around three or 4% for the rest of the year. They should discuss what happens if there's a surge in inflation, if inflation turns around and, and rises because of wages, other wage pressures that, that are plausible right now. The other thing is that the Fed can reference simple rules, simple algebraic formulas that have fit past policy pretty well and perform pretty well on models. They can say, well, look, here's a rule. We're not going to follow it you know, to the T, to the you know, second decimal point, but this gives you a flavor of how policy over the next couple of years is going to respond to how the data comes in. If the data comes in this way, plug it in on the right-hand side, the rule will tell you about what policy will be. And we'll be kind of in that ballpark. Um, so that's lesson learned number two. Big thing was the mistaken assessment or their avowed assessment that inflation was transitory in August of 20. 21, Chair Powell made this case at Jackson Hole. Uh, he argued that the surge was concentrated, not broad-based. There was just some components. Uh, he cited base effects, which is the rolling off of things 12 months ago, uh, where you know in the in the pandemic, early in the pandemic, things prices fell and then started coming back up again. Um, inflation, he said, was moderating in some categories. He noted that wages hadn't accelerated, and he cited that long-term inflation expectations were stable, uh, and that longer-term trends had been towards more dis more disinflationary than inflationary. So none of these arguments really proved reliable in this case. Um, there are always some prices going up faster than the average. There's always some coming down. Um, and rising more slowly. Wages did end up accelerating with a lag, but they did end up picking up. And now that's the problem with inflation, that it, it, that uh, wage wage costs are going up. There was a report this week, kind of the best measure of employment costs up through fourth quarter. It's long lag, but 4% at an annual rate, which with uh, productivity gains of maybe 1%, if we're lucky, is consistent with the 3% inflation rate, not two, um, and is higher than pre-pandemic. Um, measures of near-term inflation expectations did rise substantially. And I'd argue that those longer-term expectations, they don't tell you much. I mean, people just trust the Fed to do what it takes to get it down in five years. But uh, it doesn't tell you um, how strongly the, the Fed is going to need to act. Uh, so it, it, it's cold comfort, I'd, I'd call it. So I think here, uh, it, here's a, a chart that shows you the inflate, the Fed's inflation forecasts. Um, you can see the colored lines. Each different color is a different meeting, and it's their forecast of what uh, the, the inflation rate was going to be over the horizon they were looking at. The dashed black line is actual inflation. So you can see that you know, September 20, December 20, March 21, June 21, even it starts popping up a little bit. Fed was forecasting inflation to go smoothly back to 2%. And then December 21, you see the the, the big one at the top there, right about there. Um, you know, they they're forecasting, yeah, this year is going to be bad, but next year is going to be great. We're going to be under 3%. Um, and it th that turned out to be wrong as well. So um the Fed kept forecasting, yeah, so under optimal policy and, um, uh, you know, no further uh, disturbances, yeah, we're going to get back to two really fast. Um, so their forecast continually disappointed. The, the assessment leaned heavily on the idea of maximum employment, and it's in the middle of 2021, they were estimating that there was a substantial gap between actual employment and maximum employment. So maximum employment is typically defined in terms of what in economics, monetary economics and economic models is called the natural rate of unemployment. So it's the, the unemployment rate that's consistent with um, a, a steady inflation rate at target, um, a rate that can be sustained. And um, 
in addition to this, there's sort of an add-on for the notion of discouraged workers, people who drop out of the labor force and could be drawn back in. So you can adjust the, the unemployment rate to take that into account. So one perspective, going back to the 1960s, sees the natural rate as a fixed parameter, evolving only slowly. Um, so this, this shows you what that looks like. The orange line is uh, kind of the classic uh, estimate, old time uh, version of estimate of the maximum employment rate, 4%. If we're at 4%, we have maximum employment. If we're at five or six, we could get on the unemployment rate lower without causing inflation. And many workers had dropped out of the labor force. You can see that on the right. And looking at that in mid-2021, you could say, well, yeah, the unemployment rate is still 6%. We could get down to four. And there's all these people out of the labor force that could be drawn in. The other perspective um, is uh, the other perspective is that uh, the natural rate of unemployment uh, could be moving around a lot. It could fluctuate a lot. And and the 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 thought experiment um, underlying this would be, um, you know, what can the unemployment rate get to next quarter? without causing inflation next quarter. And it's probably not, you probably can't get very far from the current unemployment rate. I mean, if you look at charts of the unemployment rate, it goes up, comes down very slowly at a basically the same rate in recoveries. And so it's, um, you know, very different perspective you get. So there were other labor market indicators like the, the number of vacancies relative to the number of unemployed that were showing historically tight labor markets, they're still pretty tight. And then some of the fall in labor force participation were people that in their 50s and 60s retiring and they just never came back. They're just like, I'm not, I'm out of here. Um, took their 401ks or, and went on. So here's, here's this other perspective that the natural rate can fluctuate a lot. On the left is data going back to 49, showing the unemployment rate. And you can see how slowly it moves up and down in the recovery. And the classic estimate of the natural rate on the right is one based on economic models that allow for the natural rate to respond as the economic theory tells you it should to shocks. Um, so in the great financial crisis, 2008, a lot of residential construction workers thrown on the market. It took a while to figure out where they were gonna get a job. What's the next sector for them? What training do they need? Do they need to move? That's a timely, costly process. You shouldn't expect that to, to happen. And the inflation rate depends on that re reference rate, not on what the unemployment rate could get to at the very end of a, an expansion. So I think the Fed should rethink what it understands by the term maximum employment. And I argued this at the at the, at the Fed when I was there. They should distinguish between a longer run concept, which is where the the unemployment rate will get at the end of the recovery uh, or end of an expansion and a short run concept that can uh, deviate pretty substantially. Uh, again, this thought experiment, how low could the unemployment rate be next quarter without getting inflation? And the Fed should better understand and better explain the limits of its ability to influence the unemployment rate. It has some language in its framework about that, but it doesn't really um, place much weight on it. So another lesson learned. Political entanglements. The Fed was a strong cheerleader on fiscal stimulus from the very beginning of the pandemic. Uh, and that was, but that was a big departure. I mean, it seems natural. They're in Washington, part of the game, but it's a big depart departure from its traditional role of telling Congress, you keep out of monetary policy, leave it to us, we'll leave fiscal policy to you. Instead, the Fed was deeply involved in the design of many of the programs to the point where they were working with um, Secretary of Treasury Mnuchin on, on program design. And um, there were competing designs being worked on by other senators, by senators. I I think there's a case that the their deep involvement in and promoting stimulus, designing and promoting stimulus measures may have made it awkward and reluctant for them to pivot to a stance 
of restraint in mid-2021 when it became clear that the stimulus had gone too far and was pushing up inflation. Not uh, Credit market interventions aren't necessary for the control of monetary conditions. Um, and the Fed, for the Fed to do it, kind of circumvents Congress. A traditional rationale for this is, oh, the Fed needs to act in an emergency. Well, Congress acted in an emergency and enacted a lot of credit programs, just like the ones the Fed did in the great financial crisis in 08 and 09. So I, I think that sort of undercut the rationale for having delegating to the Fed, designing and building all sorts of credit intervention programs. I would argue, I've argued for a long time um, for the Fed to revert to a limited role in credit markets and limited um, role in uh, fiscal policy. So, interesting fact, dissents are way down under j -Pal. Uh So dissents have been declining for years. Dissents by members of the Board of Governors virtually disappeared under Greenspan. He went around and corralled everyone's votes before the meeting, and they all voted with him. Presidents kept dissenting, but then that faded off in the early 2000s, I think because the nature of the policy problems then were more limited. As inflation came under control and stayed at 2%, there was less to get agitated about. Um, but then under Bernanke, uh, dissents rose. He was doing a lot of controversial stuff. Um, and under Bernanke and Yellen, about seven out of every 10 meetings, I'll show you the graph, um, there were about seven dissents per 10 meetings. So 0.7 dissents per meeting. Um, Powell, 0.3 per meeting. So sharply off, especially since um, the pandemic. So I think this is, I think this is the result of the, the board playing a much stronger role in Reserve Bank President's recruitment. And I think it's the result of a change in the culture, the norms around communication. So Reserve Bank presidents are appointed by the board of directors of the Reserve Bank, subject to the approval of the board of governors. That's all the, the act says about it. In the old days, back when I was appointed in 04, uh, the Reserve Bank board ran the search process and at the end had a couple of names, sent them to the board for sign off. Occasionally the board would say, no, nope, uh, that's a bozo. Uh, go back and do it again. And the Reserve Bank would either dig in their heels and there'd be a confrontation, a little standoff, or they'd say, okay, we'll we'll try again. Um, now, uh, the current practice is uh, fairly in sort of co-leading, co-running the search process. So names, you know, you know how searches work. There's, you know, dozens and dozens of names. They go up to the Board of Governors, the Board vets them in addition to the Reserve Bank vetting them, sends back its own names, tells them to not look at these people, steers them this way, steers them that way. I think they've, over time, shaped the composition of the presidents in a way that they didn't try to do before 2011, say. Um, so more than, as an indicator of this, it's just an indicator, rough indicator. In 2009, more than half, seven of the Reserve Bank presidents had published in peer-reviewed academic journals more than one article about monetary economics or macroeconomics. Now that number is one, um, and it's the John Williams, the president of the New York Fed. Now, I'm not saying that you need that background to, to be brave enough to dissent, but it certainly helps. It certainly helps you come to an independent view. It helps you understand the weaknesses of the board staff's presentation, the FOMC meetings, the you know, the pluses and minuses of various arguments around the table. I just think it, it makes the liberations more robust. The, the Fed is noticeably less communicative in public as, as well. There's it, back under Bernanke, he came in, Greenspan and Volcker kind of wrote in a closed shop. You weren't, you were expected not to say anything of substance on monetary policy, leave it to them. Bernanke wanted to open things up to his credit, and I think it's really helped the public understand, especially the financial media, understand what the Fed is, what it does, how it makes its choices. Um, but that has this cost for the chairman of the Fed. It's uh, It makes things inconvenient when they go to Congress and someone can point to something someone on the inside of the Fed is saying publicly about critiquing their, their approach. Um, I think that Chairman Powell is running things more like a corporate board where he wants lots of views internally. It's not clear he's getting them, but 
open exchange of views internally, but then the house view externally. Everyone, you know, people don't critique, don't take shots at the at the chair externally. So um, I, I think that's, um, I think that's detrimental to the Fed's uh, deliberations. I think in the upcoming review, it would be useful for the Fed to reflect very carefully on its stance regarding the diversity of views and whether they're getting a complete um, and robust engagement of diverse views around the table. Um, I'll leave you with one last meta lesson. The Fed has typically avoided talking about its past performance, even internally. In contrast, the US Armed Forces routinely puts a priority on. They do after action reviews, they're done fighting a battle, they write up a review, they gather all the sources, get all the testimony, you know, some assessment about what they could have done better. They're always trying to learn about how to do better. Um, they invest in historians. There's a bunch of, I sat next to one on the plane a couple of days ago, um, historians that, uh, spend their time looking at the history of armed forces actions. Uh, the recent review of uh, its strategic framework in 2019, 2020 was useful and a step towards that. And I think that's a good thing, but um, they've promised reviews every five years. That provides a vehicle for them to reflect on past performance and maybe it, uh, admit mistakes. But notice, however, that that document is supposed to be represent a commitment. And if you review it and change the terms of the commitment every five years, it's a little less of a commitment than it otherwise would be. But I think the Fed should, I think they should commission their own either internal or internal and external panel to review the inflation surge and file a report and publicize the report. And they should own up to what it says and respond. Um, so that I think is the meta lesson learned. They they need to focus on their history and learning from the past. Thank you for your attention. Really appreciate it.